thank you for being here. Uh, we'll continue to talk about leadership and we'll continue to talk about change and how uh, this digital change and digital environment influences the way uh, we lead organizations. Um, I think that uh, we can work with a lot of things that have been said before in the keynote and in the talk. Um, and I'm curious to hear from our panel here today how this works practically during a normal workday as a C-level executive. So let me introduce um, the, the panel that we have here. Um, Ulrich Hegge, he's general manager at Comdirect Bank. Kai Schwabedal, um, chief commercial officer of E+. And Thomas Spreitzer, chief marketing officer of T-Systems International. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll uh, kick it off with a short introductory notes. Uh, I would ask you to start with your uh, little note. Yes, sure, I can. <laughs> uh, I'll keep on talking. Um, yeah, there, is, uh, there are three basic hypotheses, breath and forth. The first is the leadership will transform from managing quarters to disrupting business systems. In the past, we always made our quarter. In the future, we need to keep up with all the things that are changing and actually stay abreast of that. The middle management, most likely, will in the future realize in unknown territory. There is uncertainty. In the past, they managed within a process, or as we told it, they supervised. And there is an unfortunate news for those executing at the lower levels of the organization. Most likely, a lot of their jobs, if there are non-strategic capabilities, will disappear. And the fourth, and that comes to the network, will be what you can't do in your organization will be done by the network. So you need to be able to partner. And partner means partner in real time, designed also to decommission. Thank you so much. And you really kept it short. That is always with short introductory notes, it's always hard to uh, uh, keep the time frame. But we wanted to have some time for discussion afterwards and also some time for audience questions in the end. May I ask you to continue with your statement? Well, I think that you can't nail it down on two or three factors. As we heard from many speeches before, it's a very complex and holistic change what we have here. But what, um, if you force me to do so, basically, I would say there's one for the company side, and that's using the opportunities of that digital change to get closer to the customer. And I will explain in a second what I mean with this. And for the leaders, for the executives, I think it's basically you have to lead that change. Don't outsource it to a chief digital officer or any other project leader. Uh, maybe just to explain a little bit the first hypothesis, getting closer to the customer. You may say, well, that doesn't really sound innovative, right? Because on what else should you focus on than on your customer? Nothing new. But we have a total different game there. Because a lot of things have changed in the last five years, and I'm not repeating what all have said already by Peter Hinson. But just a couple of patterns which I see which have changed significantly to get closer to your customer. The first one is the way you interact with your customer and even with mass of customers has changed significantly. Think about social media, but also think about, you know, things like this, Nike Fuel, Nike Fuel or Chip in the Shoe, Internet of Things. You're delivering real-time information how you use these products. And Nike can make a lot of customer insights out of this for their product development. That's a total different new customer interaction and customer intimacy. The same for individualizing products. It's all started out with simple things like T-shirts. Now you can individualize cars. Local Motors is doing this. You can buy cars in the internet portal where you can figure it. You get 30% discount at einzweineuwagen.de in Germany, for example. So the, the thing is that the new startups, they are all using these kind of opportunities intuitively, but the traditional companies have problems with this. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. It would probably take too much time, but bureaucracy, processes, but also what we've heard before, they have difficulties to cannibalize their system. Think about that car example. If you sell cars directly to end users as a car manufacturer, 
your dealer organization is losing power and margins. That's why it's more difficult for these guys. That's why they think twice. And also IT, huge problem. You have all these old systems, SAP, the old ERP systems, and then you have your fa fancy apps, you know, which are usually quite fast and interactive, but with low security levels. How do you manage that challenge? That these are huge problems to overcome until to get closer to the customer. And as I said, for the leaders, I think the hypothesis, the hypothesis was saying by itself, you have to lead it. So you have to understand it. Don't do everything by your own. Get a network, but you have to sit in the driver's seat. Thanks so much. Ulrich. Yeah, I guess it's leaving me. Is that on? Yeah. Um, I, I think, it, well, for almost starting with a time when business started in itself. Every now and then you lead us. Ah, it is. Whatever, thanks. Okay. <laughs> so I believe um, at the end of the day, if you have a look at what new leaders are supposed to be about, this is nothing new. This is not a new challenge. Business has changed always. It has to adapt always. What has changed and significantly changed is the speed of how fast things are happening and that definitely poses a new challenge, um, is asking new questions of the leaders who are in charge, who, has to, uh, who have to make a difference now. So I've been a little privileged um, in actually working in two very different environments uh, where a very different style of leadership is required. First, I've started a few companies, co-founded a few companies. Working there, driving the company is something completely different than working in a huge corporation or even a middle-sized one where I am now. So, if it comes to the leadership, having a look at how fast, agile, aggressive you have to be in a startup environment, and all of a sudden, we already heard about that one this morning, you as a bigger corporation have to come up with answers to an environment where you pretty much have to act in several ways like a startup. And you're just not able to because for a startup, it might be all about growth, not being about profitability. A corporation is always asking first, how much money can I make out of that? How can I scale profitable? So that's a very different mindset. So at the end of the day, I believe what we have to talk about and what we need to discuss and where we have to come up with better ways is actually how to make that transition happen in a way that we reflect the market needs. And these market needs have changed. Thank you so much. Um, I want to iterate on a point um, that uh, you made, Thomas. Uh, you said a sentence. Uh, something around uh, don't outsource innovation uh, to a innovation chief innovation officer or chief digital officer or whatever. And I want to talk a little bit about that um, because I think that's one of the big questions that uh, all of us, whether we work in a smaller uh, startup environment or a bigger corporation, need to ask ourselves and figure out ways to implement innovation in our corporations and companies and figure out ways to um, to change existing models and existing structures. Uh, so what should we do instead? What do we do instead of outsourcing uh, innovation? How do we kind of infiltrate uh, the whole system and make it more agile and faster? Well, the answer would be probably take 15 minutes. To, <laughs> to well, try it, try it in like but, two. <laughs> but I think um, what I mean with not outsourcing is giving up the responsibility to a different board member, to call him chief digital officer, and let's do him the job and solve the problem. That mm. won't work. What I'm not saying is that you should do everything in-house. So don't get me wrong. I think to get innovations, especially as a big company or a corporate company, you need an ecosystem, or Peter called it network, of young people, of innovative startups to integrate in order to get new ideas on the ground. What we do, for example, is if we start up with new digital business like Connected Car, we basically generate, create a new unit outside of the rest of the corporate 
and incubate them within the company, give them the possibility to grow, to test things, to try things, to get in some new guys, and start up that business until it comes to a certain level of size. Because we have the same problem with what you just mentioned. If you're not doing this, you are in competition to the huge business cases with like 500 million revenue a year and X million um, EBIT a year. And if you are small, new business, you will always lose against these big bets. Mm -hmm. And that's why we think you have to find a way to some, let's say, um, do a little incubation within your own company. That's what, what I believe helps. And of course, you have to have a management who's willing to do though, so and not just looking on short-term profit targets. Yeah. So is this the way to go? No. <laughs> <laughs> just to steer things up a little here. Um, I believe, yes. At the end of the day, of course, you have to come up with, you know, with an answer to this corporation who has been set up to operate in a way where it's all about profitability, all about operational excellence and the like. Pretty much the opposite stuff as what you've seen in a typical startup. Putting a startup in a corporate environment typically kills it, like totally. Um, so, because the mindset is just quite different. Controllers, I don't hate controllers, don't get me wrong, They're quite the opposite. I believe they are extremely valuable, honestly. Um, but if you let them have a look at what you're doing with an incubator within the company, it's really, really hard to argue. My recommendation would be slightly different. Take something that's of most strategic importance. Take this. And if you believe you can do it better in a different management style, in a different, uh, under different governance, then you do your typical business. Set it up with a P&L, with an investment case, and the like, and let, and I totally, uh, totally agree with you there, let them play in a way that doesn't mean do whatever you want, but this is your strategic task, this is the money you've got to make that a business, go and we won't interfere, or at least let us interfere as at least as possible. Maybe just if I can add something. I think what, what it doesn't work, and there, there I agree, if you buy a startup and integrate it in a corporate, that doesn't work, mm. I agree. That's my experience also. Okay. But what we did there was a different thing. It was not, we, we didn't buy a startup. We had people from our corporate organization who had new ideas, and who were also using platforms, for example, the network or IT platforms of the rest of the corporate. And this is somehow a mixture of a startup, but it's not really an external mm. startup. Do these people nevertheless, have the skills? Just, Sorry. Finish, Let nevertheless, me just it's, ask it's indeed yes. not easy. Yeah. So I agree, mm. it's not an easy task. So perhaps uh, you, you have to pick sides now. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, uh, well, I knew at least one uh, before. No, I, I think there is an interesting thought on uh, do you have a disruptive business system or do you have a technological innovation? If you put something like a child of your organization apart, which goes into the same kind of financial governance and so forth logic, I think that might be as suitable. If you do a disruptive business system, the governance of the mother company will most likely kill it. If you look at Peter's suggestions, we're talking about innovative business systems, not about the new printer cartridge or even, you know, M2M business as part of, this is another part to connect devices instead of mobile phones, however being a connection between two SIM cards. So I think um, the real question is, how can corporate escape its culture and its governance mechanisms? Mm -hmm. And there the real question comes in, does corporate have a, an ability to act like in VC. Can they sustain long negative cash flows over, exper of, over extended periods of time, get away on that on the stock market, and then get the right window and make a deal in yeah, a big You, you forgot big one group. aspect hmm? on being a VC, total loss. I know. I know. So the, that, the, the hypothesis is out. Corporate has a significant problem innovating mm. and moving into new businesses mm. because 
as with the analog brands, they kind of recreate themselves. Mm. They, do not create, they do not give education to new children. If they're too wild, they get educated back on corporate culture. I, uh, I, uh, sorry, I, I interrupted you briefly before. Uh, what about the skill set that is required to work like that? In my experience, people who work in startups are an entirely different breed than the people who tend to work in corporations, at least for an extended period of time. Um, if we believe that we have to be more agile, that we have to work under different paradigms than we did before, um, how do we actually make these people happy at the corporations we're in? That's something mm. I cannot solve for, for now. We work hard on that. It's going to take some time. But uh, that's really a tough one. Yeah. Don't attract B talent, but A talent. It's awfully hard. Yeah. Let me answer uh, or ask one more question on that. Why is it so important at that point that corporate reinvents itself? I think the natural cycle would be big corporates at some point die. So if you allow them to die and give room to others, as we've seen in Peter's disruption of Airbnb, yeah, uh, it basically says the old system is going to go at some point, or with them, those who have not adapted. So that would be the alternative uh, model. Actually, the model which is currently in place, and uh, if you really look at it, it's a Darwinistic model. We're a little uncomfortable because, as Peter said, so and so many people lost their jobs. But most likely, that's the societal model on how that gets implemented. Mm -hmm. And it stems back to where is the governance right for innovation? Yeah, but I think it's, uh, I agree that it's a Darwinist model, totally. But I think it's not a digital one. So, as Darwinism is, if you, are uh, if you do a DNA mutation, you have the possibility to survive. So, and the, the question is, what are the spots for your differentiation where you can survive as a big company? Because there are some things you can do as a big company, smaller companies cannot do. That's why you still have that coexist coexistence, and even companies like Apple, you can uh, have to have done it, and it's not the only ones. I mean, if you look in the retail industry, Otto has done the turnaround, Neckermann Quelle went into insolvency. So there are some differences, and it's not a logic way that every big corporate is going let to me, die. Let, let, me, let me answer or ask you one question. Look, um, German telcos, how many people do they have working on SMS? I don't know. But don't a know. lot. How many work at WhatsApp? And the real question is, is there a right for those people really to survive? Because you see, the big organization, and that's the real question behind it, does the big organization help? Or does a fast and perhaps networked organization do a better job? Right. But I think it's in the end, it's about that customer intimacy. Because um, if you compare one model to the other, if you take a sales channel, uh, from an online bank and then are trying as a traditional bank to just do the same, you will always fail because your whole system is based on a different selling model. But if you're trying to use your physical sales force as a differentiation to the online bank or the same for the, for the online portals in the car manufacturer, you have a chance, chance for differentiation. But you have to work it out. The problem, if you look at the car manufacturing industry, is at the moment there are these new portals selling cars with 30% discount, new cars via portals. And if you are just doing the same as BMW, you will not benefit from it. You will always have a problem. But if you find a way to get the customer drawn in because they are driving today BMW, and if he's bringing his car to repairment to a garage, and then you offer him a service, you have a differentiation because an online portal will never have that relation. So that's what I think you have to find that spot where your differentiation let me, is. Let, let, let me interrupt for a second. Uh, Although the discussion is really interesting, we're running very short on time, and I, I want our audience to also get an insight on, on your daily challenges that you face in, in leadership and have like a really short last round. What is the biggest challenge you, you face in leadership uh, in those, this changing environment, uh, and how do you tackle it? That's actually What's an, the first that comes to <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's actually an odd one, most probably, and one that's very specific to the industry I'm working in. Um, that's a regulatory framework. Mm. Might sound odd, but um, every now and then, 
actually quite a few times over the last couple of months. We have a great idea, check what has to be done, and people are disappointed and not motivated and not going strongly forward mm. because they realize, oh boy, mm. to, to be doing it like that, that wouldn't be the hard part to get the regulators agree mm. on how to do this. That's a tough one. So that's very specific, but that's pretty much okay. top, on my mind, uh, okay. top of my mind. Uh, so Kai, what is your uh, biggest you know, challenge? I, I just pick on one of the discussions we had. The discussion uh, is always, do we focus on being fast and aggressive enough? We just talked about, could we build an old channel to be better with a customer, have more customer intimacy? Actually, the question for me would be, to a car manufacturer, you're selling mobility or you're selling cars? So you need to go to drive now and understand that? Or are you still on a special uh, leather trim inside the car? So the question in the future will be, can the organization follow that speed? Mm. The biggest challenge for me as a leader in a corporate is to create an environment to give people enough freedom to take their decisions on their own and realize their ideas because, and as you said it before, I think that's, you need these kind of bright people, but uh, usually the corporate regulations and systems give them not enough freedom mm. to decide. Mm. But you need that speed mm. because, and that, that's what Peter said, I totally agree, you don't have the time anymore to act in classical linear organizations yeah. that won't work, but if the rest of your system is hindering from you to do that, then it's getting really a challenge. That's my biggest challenge in operative work. Thank you so much. And I think uh, we'll have a little bit more time for audience questions uh, for a few. Um, we can hand over our microphone. So if you just uh, give us a sign if there are questions. And I actually don't see it because the light is too bright. So someone from the, the team will have to tell us. No questions. Okay, that's surprising. Is everyone still asleep? <laughs> Was the partying too hard yesterday? <laughs> no, we don't actually need no new leaders. Or, or problems we don't have need, been solved and all the wrong people uh, are here anymore. right here at the panel. No, so then let's, kidding, then let's continue. I see we have some, uh, a, a little bit more, more time now. So we got granted uh, a little bit more time. So let's uh, just continue with, with uh, the, last, uh, the last round of challenges you said. Do you feel that in your corporations, because we all talk about big corporations here, um, that are, and we all know that, um, always, change always means that there is also some part of a corporation that's reluctant uh, to change or that's not willing to completely reinvent themselves or disrupt the business model. How do you actually, um, how do you react to that? And how do you react to, to parts of your team as a leader, but also to other parts of the leadership team that don't want to innovate the way you do? Well, <laughs> I think it's, uh, it, that's the discussion we had before. It hasn't changed in the last 2,000 years. You know, <laughs> the, in, in the Romans, uh, also Machiavelli, you know, you, you can take um, different examples. It's about finding people who, uh, where you can make a win-win situation. In, in order to, uh, to get things done. Because in such a complex uh, organization, usually it's difficult to do everything on your own. So you have to convince people you ha from, you have to, I think you have to put passion in it. And uh, you have to get people on your side to, to work for your uh, targets together with you to get, uh, on, on, on implementing this. So that's really the simple answer to it. That really hasn't not so much changed. The question is just, you have less time for that. Mm. Yeah, and um, the possibilities of interacting are different than in the past, but the principle hasn't changed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, what has changed is definitely the speed yeah, at which the market is changing. Um, so to make people understand, for example, um, well, you, you don't have to discuss if you want to be with your customer if you have to do mobile right or not. But typically, if you have a look at the P&L of the company and if, if you have a look at the business impact, there, there's definitely a price to pay if you don't do it. Do you feel it right now? Do you get additional transactions or whatever? 
if you do it right now, most probably just a few or nothing at all. If you don't do it, you're lost hmm. at the end of the day. And to make, to make the company aware of that danger and of the speed, and where's that happening? That for me is really a really tough one. Um, people aren't dumb. They understand, they look at what is happening, but to understand at the very moment you reach this very specific, yeah, I know this infamous tipping point, but if you've reached it, you're kind of lost to struggle back, uh, to fight your way back. That's going to be a hard struggle. So, and to make people aware of that, don't panic, but we have to act now. That's definitely a challenge. And to take people along on the ride. Anything so, you want to add to that? No, no, it's yeah. a question on being bold and uh, fast. And actually, don't panic, but we have to act now. That's a really, I think that really puts it in a nice way because that's, that's actually the balance that you, uh, that you have to keep uh, all the time. So uh, Peter Hinson said, said something uh, in his keynote. He said that many of us will have the feeling that we live in our private lives in the 21st century. But uh, during, during our day in our corporate life, um, we actually work in a work environment uh, from the 20th century. I somehow could relate to that, uh, at least for some of my work days. And let's be honest, do you too? Or do you already work in a 21st century modern corporate environment? I believe for a bank, we're quite modern, and I still feel that yeah. way. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a bit of both. On one side, of course, as I said before, you have in corporates that situation that you have security issues, old systems, and it's not changing so fast. You have the new topic, the new apps and stuff like that on your smartphones. Um, actually, that's not so much the big point for me. I think it's really more the points what I was discussing before, how, how you can act faster in a, such a big organization is the bigger problem. Yeah. I think uh, you're right, but I would separate. Formal organizations are still the old ones, and they're giving stability and orientation to a lot of people. Actually, how the business is done is already approaching a little bit the 21st century. So things are fluid. However, this is not reflected in an equal understanding of how it really would work. If we really look at it, we don't have a model or reference frame as we used in the past, like an org chart or a workers' council or uh, things like that that give us its stability. So it's a very interesting um, way how a lot of people who understand new normal start working as freelancers for big corporate instead of working as employees because they're already a part of a network working on two or three customers only two to three days a week with their major customer, but not accepting full employment anymore. And here you see how the 21st century approaches, but the old one is not dissolved. And actually, those, some consider them to be Scheinselbstständige, and actually they might be or they might not be, I don't know, but they're already luring, they're lured into the future of flexibility. Mm. So you see, we're stuck. So in the best case, if we sit here again on this panel in this uh, situation in three years from now, what at best would we have reached? What would the goal be? <laughs> That's actually a lot tougher than it sounds. <laughs> well, I'd say two I, years. <laughs> oh, no. That makes it easier. No, uh, uh, we kind of implicitly answered that already, I guess, because um, if you have a look at the challenges we face, uh, where we have to follow the market faster, where we have to understand better what's happening and to have to make that happen, being bold, fast, aggressive. If we haven't achieved that, you will have three pretty thorough people here. Or we won't be sitting here anymore. Because we won't have our jobs anymore. I mean, oh, that's, we, uh, that's probably going to be... Of course, we would be here with totally different jobs, but anyway... <laughs> I agree. I don't have to repeat what's already said. I think that's, that's it. You have to, to be faster and be more aggressive and getting the right people on board. I think we would all be more comfortable if we have acknowledged that the world is changing that way instead of staring at it and looking a little bit like, oh, this happens. Um, do I really <laughs> see it happening to me? Or 
couldn't we just hinder it and the world will work on. So basically the old question, is this internet thing going away? Is this soon? going away again? <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's great last words uh, for, yeah. for this uh, discussion. Unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening and thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.